Assalamualaikum everyone. Uh, welcome to our third plenary speech addressing the theme Humanizing Technology in Line with the Principle of Maqasid Sharia. Allow me to start with a few housekeeping announcements. To our participants, please make sure your microphone is on mute uh, more throughout the presentation. Uh, this talk will be conducted for 50 minutes, followed by a 10 minute question and answer. During the QA session, you may type your question in the chat box, but please state your name and institution at the beginning of your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the title of our third plenary speech today is Islamic Bioethics Meets Ontology Conceptualizing the Human Being in the Era of Cameras, Cyborg, and Genetic Technologies. We are very grateful uh, and honored to have our professor, Dr. Asim Parilla, all the way from United States of America to deliver this topic with us today. Before I invite our respected speaker, allow me to take the honor to read his brief uh, introduction. He is currently a professor of emergency medicine, bioethics and humanities, as well as vice chair of research and scholarship in department of emergency medicines at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He also directs a nonprofit platform for research, education, and dialogue known as Initiative on Islam and Medicine. After receiving his medical degree and master in healthcare research, he continued his specialty training in emergency medicine, followed by clinical medical ethics. On top of his medical qualifications, he also holds degree in biomedical engineering and classical Arabic, and has also studied in Islamic theology and law. Overall, his scholarship aims at improving health and healthcare through better accommodating religious value in healthcare delivery. He has authored over 100 peer reviewed journal articles and book chapters and holding editorial positions for various important academic journals, including American Journal of Bioethics and BMC Medical Ethics. With that brief introduction, let us all welcome Prof. Dr. Asim Parilla. Assalamu alaikum. It is truly a pleasure to be here with you. I wish we could be in person, but alhamdulillah, I'm glad that the virtual platform is working. Give me one second to share my screen. Bismillah. Is that working? So alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. Allahumma alimna bima yanfa'una wa yanfa'una bima tu'allimuna. Alhamdulillah, again, it is a pleasure to be with you all today. Inshallah, one day we will get to see each other in person. Today, my talk, as thank you, Dr. Shayanwar and Dr. Hashi for inviting me to come here today, is on the topic he already mentioned. I made a slight change because I would like to touch a little bit on CRISPR Cas9 at the end of my talk. But to give you a sense of who I am, uh, beyond just what you just heard, I conduct research and scholarship at this intersection between the tr Islamic tradition, biomedicine, and Muslim practices. And what that means is that I look at three major different groups, Muslim patients, Muslim physicians and providers, and ulama. So with the aspect of my research on Muslim patients, I'm interested in how Islam animates their decisions and how it informs their healthcare behaviors. With Muslim physicians, I'm interested in how Islam informs their identity how they think about the bioethical attitude, how Islam informs the bioethical attitudes they have and the way they practice medicine. And then with ulama, I'm interested in how they think about the tradition and this interaction with biomedicine as a body of knowledge. So I conduct empirical, textual, and theological research. And as you heard, I do that in an academic capacity at the Medical College of Wisconsin and in a more a community forum at the Initiative on Islam and Medicine. So today's talk has three parts. The first part I'm going to touch upon the uh, Islamic bioethics. And I put Islamic in quotes because we're gonna discuss what that may or may not mean. So some terms and what the dialogical partners are within the discourse of Islamic bioethics, as well as how we deliberate and get derived moral positions in this field. I will also talk about largely the shortcomings and gaps in this discourse and in the analytic modes. The second part of the talk will relate to genetic genetics discourse, right? So I'm going to discuss the principal, uh, the, sorry, the, the principal ethical issues and concerns, and discuss conceptions of the human being that underlie this discourse. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about enhancing Muslim and Islamic bioethical deliberation. In this last part of my talk, I'm going to pose several questions about how we think about theological concepts around the human being. 
And then I want to present perhaps a notion of a multidisciplinary dialogue model that will help us address these questions. But then I actually do want, and I'm going to save some time for go back and forth with the audience around these areas. So let's launch into the first part of my talk on Islamic bioethics. When you often think about that field, it starts in this sort of way. A Muslim physician has a question, and that question is posed to an Islamic scholar. The Islamic scholar thinks about whether this action or this issue, how is it addressed within the Quran and the Sunnah? They might use the maqas of the Sharia to think about it, or use some qawaid, and they will adjudicate the matter along a moral status uh, continuum from obligatory to forbidden and issue a fatwa. Either they're positive about this action or this technology or they're negative. That is what you usually think by Islamic bioethics is. It's a fatwa-based enterprise. And if you think about it that way, then what ends up happening in terms of the moral deliberation is sort of quasi-utilitarian. You have a scholar who is largely thinking about things in darura, right? Whether there is a dire need or necessity that makes it such that the technology or the action should be permitted, or whether there is maslaha, whether there is some positive societal benefit or actually individual benefit as well that will lead us again to permit this action. And when you look at the large body of Islamic bioethical rulings or medical fiqh, you will find that these are the concepts that are employed, the rura or maslaha. Largely, it's, a, it's an enterprise that permits things using these concepts because of a dire need or because there's some judgment or adjudication or assessment that there's some positive benefit by allowing such things. I'm going to argue that this enterprise is largely permitting the status quo, right? That it's just a it's, a, it's a way by which scholars can reduce the notion, or in this these two concepts, can reduce the notion of sin within an action and let things go on as they are. The biomedical en enterprise marches on. Now, I'm saying this because when we think about Islamic bioethics, there's a lot of contention around what that means. What is the Islamic and Islamic bioethics? There are contentions around what the source of ethical normativity is within that field. There are also contentions around what are the methods of deriving those norms. If you think Islamic means Islamic law, then there's questions on how you derive that Islamic law, or Sudi paradigms or Maqasidi paradigms or other paradigms. The other part of this sort of a conjunction of two terms, Islamic and bioethics, also poses several questions, right? What is the scope of concern of bioethics? And who is the audience that we're speaking to when you're talking about Islamic bioethics? These are also uh, issues within the field of Islamic bioethics. What largely ends up happening, I must say, is that when you think about Islamic bioethics, it's this sort of caricature on the left, that you have some sort of pronouncements that are relevant to a Muslim country in a Muslim context with Muslim personnel, both the patient and the provider. That's how Islamic bioethics has become marginalized, both by those who produce it, but by also by the audience. That is an enterprise that is discoursing with a particular Muslim context, perhaps even a Muslim minority context in some countries, but a majority context in places like Malaysia. And that's all it is. That it is just a enterprise for that group. I would argue that that shouldn't be the case nor was that the case that we started the field with. So if that's what's occurring, what happens to the literature, the discourse, right? The discourse occurs, the actors meet, the fatwas are issued, the patient and the provider get the fatwa. What happens to the larger academic bioethics, Islamic bioethics literature? I would argue that that field is a confusing array of concepts, right? That people have different notions of what's right and wrong, what's forbidden and what's permitted. And so it leaves this sort of body of a lot of plurality without clarity around what is an Islamic bioethical position. I would argue that from the perspective of even for this course, the mark, and in a way that is generally speaking, is that people is course, right? That is not to the policymakers or or the decision or the, the academicians. And so it is more that we may or may not look to. And I recognize that I'm saying that sitting in the United States, right, within a premier bioethics academy, but I just want to share that with you. That's how people sometimes marginalize the discourse. And you'll see. So if this is what has happened, and we've, as Muslims, right, we have participated in this discourse with a certain way, have contributed to this state of affairs, 
What has happened with the scientific ethics and the moral discourse is that we have flattened dimensionality. Well, by, by that I mean that we respect an individual. Act. Yet the other fonts of ethical or moral deliberation within our tradition are not drawn upon. So where is theology or philosophy? How are Saudi and Kalami concepts thought about, which should produce, right? Are they the productive mechanism, the creative forces within our tradition? We have left it to legal ethics, which occurs obviously and is focused on the moral status of the action. But the other area that's also left out is practical or other or virtue ethics. That's agent focused. So if you think about the action, we've forgotten the production and the end goal. We've forgotten what the agent's about. And we have focused just on the moral status of the action in a limited way. We have flattened right, dimensionality of what is a very multi-dimensional ethical discourse within our tradition. It's lacking, and the other way actually is that the best calculus, right, the rural maslaha, the ruratan or maslahatan is all focused on largely short-term benefits, right, that are largely individual focused. It also lacks multidisciplinarity. And by that, I mean, it's dependent simply on doctors and jurists, right? Social scientists, policy makers, bioethicists who have trained as bioethicists are largely at the margins of the discourse. This is predominantly a doctor and jurist enterprise. Even patient voices are sometimes not as much present. And that's largely reactive. I think you would have no, uh, I would have no argument when I say that, that the Islamic bioethics discourse responds to techno-scientific developments from the West, right? We import scientific and bioethical paradigms through an educational imperialist modality and then we communicate them in some sort of nay, a way by Islam might or may not have to say. Now, I can't speak to a Malaysian audience without mentioning the maqasid based approaches to Islamic bioethics, since they are very much in vogue within uh, Malaysia. And without mentioning uh, Professor Omar Hassan Kusule, who will be speaking, I believe, tomorrow at this uh, esteemed Congress. So he has popularized, and at IAUME used some of these models, thinking about how maqasid might provide a medical ethics deliberation modality. That's drawn from the tradition. I would argue, and I'll, I'll say that he, the model that, that is uh, adapted, uh, applied, right, is surface level theorization. And by that, I mean the uh, human interests, right? The five maqasid are then theorized vis-a-vis -vis how they relate to medicine. So religion becomes facilitating worship. Life becomes total health and well-being. Progeny is procreative capacity. Intellect becomes mental health. And wealth becomes societal, societal wealth. That, th that these largely huge concepts within our tradition become reduced in some sort of way to how they relate to medicine when you think about them. And, and then in terms of ethical deliberation, the five essential maqasids become a framework of hierarchical principles. So... Um, as he notes in one of his articles, that for a medical issue to be ethical, it must fulfill or not violate one or more of the five purposes, right? And he maintains a hierarchy in this sort of way, life, religion over life, over progeny, over intellect, and over wealth. So these are Shatlabis, or perhaps even Ghazadian five uh, interests, five uh, you know, maqasid, and they become principles in this framework. Now, others in Malaysia as well uh, have adapted this and expanded this in a certain way, but still stick to the surface level theorization. They add three analytic levels where you want to think about whether the, the intention behind the act, the nature of the technology and the outcome produced. So they're adding multiple dimensions of adjudication. And then they say that if there's conflicting you know, evidence about the maqasid and this biotechnology, you should then resort to qawaid. Nonetheless, this is still surface level theorization. All these human interests are thought about in terms of medicine, not as what they are in a large expansive view of society. So as I mentioned, there's a, I have a healthy critique of this, inshallah, more to come on this uh, in another future session. But, but I say that there are three general approaches to maqasid the Sharia usage in Islamic bioethics that are beyond just surface level theorization. The issue, however, when you use it for medical ethics is that if you use these maqasid as principles, the, we should recognize that the hierarchy was never settled within the tradition. Shatabi, Gamadi al Pliya, Ghazali, Jiwaini, they all have different views on whether religion is the first and foremost interest that the law should protect or whether life is. So that is exists within the fiqhi literature, within the usul literature, and it doesn't play a role. If you're going to use them as principles, you have to resolve that conflict, and we don't really think about it that way. There's no balancing mechanism when you use them as principles, right? So as we know, that qawaid have the wabit, right? What are the checks upon maqasid? 
there is no balancing mechanism. And this can, the one you use this as a medical ethics deliberative model, this plays a huge role. What if there are conflicts between the acid? How do you balance them? And then if you use them as end goals, right? Then as I already mentioned, they're redefined as related to medicine instead of theological ends for health and healing. And, uh, and this is a challenge when you just wanna use them as surface level principles. Now, uh, not to say there's no benefit within that, but this is the field, right? We have fiqhi approaches, and we have a little bit maqasti extensions, but we still remain within this largely dominant modality of thinking about Islamic bioethics. So with that said, I'm going to move to the second part of my talk, talking about how we think about larger scoping issues within the field of bioethics. And I'm, you see here, there's a, 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 a maxim here, al-hukum ala ashayi faran an tasawwirihi, that the ruling of a thing, right, is, is related to, is dependent upon the taswil, the conceptualization of the thing. And I use that because we have to conceptualize what is occurring before we start issuing verdicts. And in my mind, to, and my argument would be that you can conceptualize health and healing through kalam, right? You must do that prior to thinking about using usul and maqasid, and certainly prior to using fiqh, that these larger concepts today are different than they were years ago. And we must define them first and conceptualize what they mean for an Islamic moral vision before proceeding to use the tools, right? Fiqh is a tool to achieve a moral vision that Islam might have. So with that, we're gonna now move to the second part of my talk on genetics. So over the last you know, 25, 30 years, we've had a significant advancement in biomedicine, right? In scientific vocabulary, as well as thinking and technology. And it started perhaps, you might say in the nineties when you had this notion of the human genome product, project, you have, a, 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 you have Francis Collins and here Craig Vinter who are leading that in the United States, thinking to how to decode the human blueprint in their words. You had cloning occur, right? This is a Sir, e, a Sir Ian who cloned the Dali as the first sheep. So this was from a genetic code. He created many actually sheep and Dali was the one, one of the ones that survived. And then you had Bill Clinton in the United States who said the entire human genome, right? Without, without this, is, uh, sorry, without a doubt, this is the most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. Note the words produced by humankind, right? And it's a wondrous map meaning that this would allow us to chart a future somewhere. And so this was in the 90s, early 2000s. And then after that, and more recently, we had launches of significant sort of biomedical enterprise based on the human genome project, right? We had notions of personalized medicine where we could create medicines that would target your unique DNA composition to address diseases that are unique to you, right? So pills that are personalized. We had the Qatar Genome Project, there was a similar one in, 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 uh, in Saudi Arabia, where they're trying to map out the entire genome right, of a Qatari population to address diseases and prevent them. And you had this notion of precision public health, right? And the, the omics revolution, genomics and phenomics and transcriptomics, where now we're thinking not just about individuals or populations, again, with a notion that we would be precise about how we treat these populations through unlocking the secrets that might exist within the human genome. You had bioethicists thinking about this at the onset, right? So the Human Genome Project had the ELSI program with it of bioethical scholars trained largely in secular ethics. So we're thinking about the social, ethical, and legal issues. And this also played a role in public discourse where you had notions of whether the, the data contained within the genome is related to an individual, is it owned by an individual or should it be relegated to state property or is no one's property? So these conversations occurred in popular press as well. And now today we've moved beyond this notion of the human genome to much more complex things. So such as human users, I think that there was a, of a cell line partially interest in DNA and partially chimpanzee, or partially there's another one with this one, with pig DNA hybrids to create solutions for problems such as kidney failure, right? And organ transplantation. Uh, we have your unlock your DNA and understand what it means, right? So this is in the public sphere. We have in the popular for kids, we have games. A genetic survival game based on on how you splice together different genomes to create a type of animal that will survive 
And then you had this idea, and you had this idea where now scholars of ethics, scholars of religion are thinking, well, what does this mean for us? How do we think about this, right? There's a clash between this new genetics, right, and human values, or there's a clash between genetics, right, and religion. And in this, uh, in this dialogue, Muslims have, I would say, been largely in the back. Right, not fully participating. So with that, I'm gonna share with you some notions of what the genetics discourse looks like. And I say that because Muslim or Islamic bioethics is reactionary to things that are happening, quote unquote, in the West. Technologies or the way they think about things, we're responding to that. So it's very important for us to understand what they're talking about before we respond. And know that bioethics is a multidisciplinary enterprise, right? You have PhDs and physicians and JDs, who are thinking about things in a and using their own disciplinary uh, expertise. Uh, bioethics is also has multiple tiers, right? You have practical ethics, or you have policy level ethics, applied versus theoretical foci. But even in the discourse of academic bioethics, there are contestations over the ethical. What is the source of moral truths? How do we reason about that, right? Who is the authority? So this is in the background of how I share this because this is the background upon which we then have a discourse. So what is when we look at genetics, we're gonna think about what is it? I'll define it for you. And then we're gonna think about what are the bioethicists talking about and how are they talking about it, right? Before we think about responses, what are they, what is it? What are they talking about? And how are they talking about it? Gen genetics discourse is a study of the ethical issues that arise out of the science of genetics and, and the use of genetic technologies. And now it incorporates also genomics discourse. So to get at what they're talking about, I, you know, I did a study where we did a systematic literature review uh, of Medline bioethics discourse, and we limited it to academic bioethics discourse by thinking about just the top 10 bioethics journals by H5 index. We wanted to think about gen genetic, genetics, so genomics and all the related terms were put into a search engine. And then we restricted uh, the scope of the search to five years, uh, 2011, 2016, and just the English language, because that's the predominant uh, language within those journals are produced in bioethics. Now to understand what they're talking about, we employ qualitative discourse and anal analytic methods. So we did content analysis. Two researchers independently, myself and a colleague of mine, identified codes. And what this by this, we wanted to see what the paper was talking about. What is the ethical question that they're addressing? Then we, that would be what we'll call the trunk. Then we thought about the terms they use to address that question, right? And we, that's, those are branches. Then we group these trunks and branches to try to understand the tree, right? And really not just the tree, what the ethical issue was, but what was, are the roots of the tree? And I would argue those are uncovering ontologies or conceptualizations of the human being that lead to certain types of questions and that lead to certain types of answers to those questions. That it is the roots, these ontologies, the conceptualizations of the human being that allow this discourse to have certain types of reasoning exercises employed and to lead to certain questions and answers. And then this is not, if you wanna think about it from a religious lens, this is similar to induction within our tradition, right? How we got to maqasid, to looking at various different, uh, you know, uh, scriptural sources or to istiqrat or other modalities of induction within our liturgical tradition. So again, the, the point here is that by looking at discourse, by looking at words, you can delineate concepts, right? In this case, ethical concepts, which then uh, are driven by certain worldviews. So when we react to a discourse, I would argue we should think about the worldview that is leading to certain types of questions and concepts being employed. And that would be a much more holistic enterprise of critiquing biomedicine than just a fatwa-based, fiqh-based, permissibility and permissibility discourse. So what did our literature search show? This is the, 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 the paper, one of the papers that we produced. So we came up with, we found 203 articles and there were six ethical, uh, six domains of ethical concern. I'm gonna speak about just the red here, but there were six of them. And the red here, the information disclosure and data ownership was one area of ethical concern. Human enhancement and modification was another area of ethical concern. And then human reproduction related ethics was another level of concern. Uh, we argue that there were three ontologies that drove those entire areas of concern. The first being the human being as a source of information about the past, present, and future. And that ontology, that conceptualization, led to notions of information disclosure and data ownership. The human being as a reproductive organism 
that led to a discourse around human reproduction related ethics. And then the human being as a biologically evolving entity, which led to the ethical concerns and questions around human enhancement and modification. And let me demonstrate that in a few slides. So we understand that the human being, uh, the human being, the first uh, conceptual is the human being as a data repository. You and I know, right, that underlying the organism is a cell within the cell is chromosomes, within the chromosomes are genes, right? And that this is the scientific uh, uh, ontology, so to speak, of what we're comprised of, right? Genes lead to protein expression, lead, and that leads to cell, and uh, within cells, which leads to certain types of phenotypes, which leads to certain types of, of behaviors. Now, genes make us who we are, as the papers would say, and it's a blueprint for these proteins, as I mentioned. They also confer characteristics from one generation to the next. So when you think about this conceptualization of the human being in the ethics discourse, there are concerns about the information contained or stored within that DNA, right? Those chromosomes. Because there's information about the past, we can decipher what your ancestral linkages are. It's about the present. We can explain your, con your constitution, your phenotype, right? your characteristics. Uh, and, and in the future, we can predict your, not in the future, but future looking, we can predict your disease risk based on your certain characteristics within your, within your genome. For example, BRCA right, leads to breast cancer risks. And then it's also information contained within this, these strands of DNA is not just relegated to about the individual. As I already mentioned, at least we can think about ancestral linkages. So there's a history, it relates to a group of people, right? You might be related to certain types of ancestors that you might not know about. And it's also those disease risks are not just about the individual. Should you carry the BRCA uh, uh, gene? Well, then your progeny might, right? Or your sisters might. And so this has disease risks, again, beyond the single individual. The questions that emerge from this then obviously are related to several domains of information, right? Uh, and ownership. So who owns the data is the first question that we have to think about and that the ethicists think about, right? Is it just the biological donor of the material or is it all of those it pertains to? Meaning that if you were to find something in my DNA, anybody that's implicated by that should be told about it because it also relates to them. What are the moral duties related to this data, right? And the ethical concepts that were used, constructs that were used in the discourse are about duty to disclose someone has a duty to these risk, the consent to disclose, or a duty to rescue someone who doesn't want to know, but you find an incidental finding on some DNA swab, you should tell them or not. And the constructs of the recipient are rights to know. Is there a right to know or there is a right not to know about incidental disease findings or potential disease risks? Once you have information, what do you do with it? The second conceptualization or ontology of the human being present within the discourse was the human as a reproductive organism. You all again know all this, right? That it takes uh, the two ma in the, in the hadith, right? The two waters, but in this case, the egg and the sperm to come together, right? Um, and you get a zygote and you get an embryo. So this is again, based on our understanding of uh, embryology and human reproduction. Now, generally speaking, uh, this discourse takes it, it's not just that a human being is a reproductive organism, that is essential quality of mankind, of humankind, right? And there's two ways to reproduce now, biologically, sexually, which is a natural form, or asexually. And that asexual reproduction has now been made possible by genetic technologies. So this type of procreation is now made possible, again, from the notion of what this ontology is. So what are the ethical constructs within the discourse? Well, there are ethical constructs related to parenthood, for example, the right to reproduce. Does every human being now have a right to reproduce? And then healthcare systems should help fulfill that right. They're mandated or obligated to fulfill that right, right? Um, they're charged to do so. Does a parent have the duty of procreative beneficence that you must seek out the best sort of genetic composition for your child? This is your responsibility to the future generation. What about the ethical constructs thinking about the to be born? Well, there's issues of, well, if you have a child that has a certain sort of mal malady or defective genetic profile, can they complain against you for not rectifying it, right? Or is it the fact that you are now getting rid of a certain population because you've decided that I don't want to procreate with this population. I want to not put that embryo within my, uh, within my uterus and only select ones that have a better profile. So entire generations are now lost. And is there a right not to be born? If you were to choose to have a child that has a certain malady, trisomy 21, for example, today, you, many places and countries allow you to abort. Now, does that child have a right not to be born? 
not to suffer as they do, if they do suffer. You know, the, as I already mentioned, uh, when you think about this essential quality, then the question for us becomes, is biomedicine obligated to help people reproduce? But not just those who can normally, but what about those who cannot, right? So there's papers around over-harvesting from brain dead, dead people so that they can carry on. If you believe there's a right to reproduce, a brain dead state might be in between living and dead. Can we create, take the ova out so in the future she can have progeny, although she might not be living? Is that for her right? What about producing synthetic, gam synthetic gametes for same-sex couples? This is also within the discourse because you can create, create, take out the nucleus from a sperm, put it in a donor egg, and then have the other sperm impregnate, you know, mix, add mix with that and create a, a synthetic gamete and so for a same-sex couple. Is this, if there's a right to reproduce, should our biotechnology be used in this way to help them reproduce? What about cloning, right? So these sorts of questions and conundrums come in within the discourse. And for us, I would say, you know, there's a, a, an interesting notion here about parenthood. The entire concept of parenthood is thrown into disarray with our ability to separate out traditional roles within parenthood. So now you can separate out genetic parenthood from gestational parenthood, from social parenthood, right? By all these different processes. So what does parenthood mean? Right? And, and this question also is thought about significantly within the bioethics discourse. The last uh, conceptualization is the human as a biological, biologically evolving entity. And here we think about the fact that the human genome is not static, right? It is always evolving due to natural occurring mutations and selection all the time. You know, not 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, and today, the human genome and mass is a bit different. So the question becomes for bioethicists and in the discourse, you know, how do we think about natural versus induced enhancement? If we select, for example, to not allow for people to have children with trisomy 21, are we, is that natural? Is that induced? What does it mean? And is it ethical or not ethical? What is the line between enhancement and therapy? So if I were to, and this came up with CRISPR-Cas9, right? If I were to um, change the genetic composition it's just that someone does not have a disease risk, is that therapy? Because it's actually occurring before disease came. Or is that enhancement of a human being, right? You, you, you're preventing that from happening. Is that preventive therapy? Or is it enhancing a human being so they no longer have that disease risk? And then the other questions are about the ethical notions to, to help flourishing, right? Can we... Uh, uh, selectively, uh, in, uh, sort of selectively in, uh, in, uh, intervene upon the human genome to create more sturdy human beings, just like we do with plants and crops, right? We're more resistant to pollution, for example. Uh, and then the notions of dignity of the human genome. So as I mentioned, right, this, this notion uh, is not science fiction, right? We have today, uh, you know, uh, chimeras in labs that are hybrids of human and porcine DNA. But there is science fiction here around the Titan, this is a movie uh, I encourage you to look at, but the notion of, well, if we have to leave the planet Earth, would we then use genetic technologies so that we can survive in a different planet? So what are the Muslim responses to this ethics, this genetics discourse? Well, in this paper, in, the, in, this, in this study, you know, the sum total out of the 203 articles that had anything to do with the religion were five, right? Out of the top 10 journals in bioethics. So across all of religious thinking, or religious scholars, right, who are in this discourse, very a minority were actually being published or producing something that was worthy of publishing, however you want to analyze it, or maybe they didn't write anything. And within those five articles, there was one about, uh, there's two about Muslims. One was about paternity and one was about a sociological study and from Malaysia on how people think about genetic technologies. But that was it. There wasn't a robust discourse. So again, then what we fall back on, we fall back upon the fiqh discourse, right? Where there might be some fatawa and some juridical rulings from councils on genetics technologies and gen genomics and genetics, but nothing that's actually a larger scoping view within this, you know, within bioethics proper or academic bioethics. But more recently, actually, you know, a very good friend of mine, Muhammad Ghali at, uh, in Qatar, you know, he had a seminar, uh, a multi-space seminar. We thought about the genomic question. We, he produced a book. Uh, some of my findings today that I'm presenting with you come from a chapter within that book. And now he launched 
uh, more recently last year, a project to engage with the public around genomics technologies since Qatar has a human gene, has a, a genome project. So he's working on a more multidisciplinary enterprise to think about these things on a larger scale than just a fiqh enterprise of is this permissible, not permissible. Now back to my, my slide here. Uh, my argument is that we have to have a better tasfir. Before we do that, uh, have a hukum, we have to have a better tasfir what's going on. I just showed you over 25 years what's occurring in society, right? That there is a revolution, so to speak, in scientific and technological advances, advancements around genetics and genomics. And that's leading to certain types of questions that bioethicists are addressing within society, right? But undergirding all of that are certain constructions of the human being. And I would argue that scientific bioethics commentators are better prepared to address or attend to these if we're going to be reactive when you understand the biophilic concepts and conceptions that are being invoked, right? You need to understand these roots and these trunks before you just think about the branches because where we are are just the branches. And I would argue that to address those concepts and those conceptions, you have to move upstream from fiqh to theology, right? To just assume itself before you get to maqas and the fiqh. Now, the other way to think about this, to have a more holistic discourse, is to think about it in this sort of way. So any biomedical, a mineral assessment of biotechnology has three components, generally speaking, right? We think about the implications and ramifications, meaning the harms and benefits of that technology. We think about the origin of that scientific development or that science itself or that technology itself, where it came from, right? That, that has moral significance. Then we think about, sorry, then we think about the nature and essence of the act, uh, object acted upon, right? So those are the three components. Now, when we use maslaha and darura, I would argue we're just thinking about harms and benefits. That's the moral calculus being done. Not necessarily, right? Not necessarily the origin or the subject. And so my point again here is that to have a full-blown bioethical analysis, we need to move beyond just these sorts of things or incorporate a larger holistic enterprise. Now, um, I'm not speaking from an alien notion here, right? That we recognize that within our tradition, there are other fonts of morality beyond Islamic law, the soul, kalam, and adab. There are other ways we think about the ethical or the moral. But when you think about science bioethics, it must engage with the multiplicity of ways in which, uh, which we think about the bioscience that's involved, how it relates to clinical practice, or the social scientific notion of what's occurring right, in, in, in society. Why is the question asked the way it's asked? What does the medical science say about that? How are the co contemporary philosophers and bioethicists thinking about these things? What are the policy ramifications? To have a holistic discourse of the science bioethics, you must engage with all of these dimensions. And again, my larger scoping critique is that we are looking at one or two dimensions, not all of them. Now, what does that mean, practically speaking for us, right? So, so let's take a different. So if instead of thinking about just the end result and the morality of an action, we thought about the ontological concepts, right? Or the human conceptualizations that are playing a role within this discourse. Well, then we'd ask the question for this ontology, the human as a data repository, what is the relationship between knowledge and the human being in our tradition, right? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a source of all knowledge and Adam and Islam was taught, right? Adam and Islam was taught, right? Then, how do we think about that? So if that knowledge that was taught to Adam Islam, if he owned it, then perhaps there's permission to use it. But if he is just a steward of that, then we must think about the haqq of Allah within that, right? It is not our dominion. This would, if you're thinking about the human being as a data repository, you must have some notion about what is the relationship between knowledge and the human being. Then if you're thinking about from a, that's from a theoretical and conceptual stage, and thinking about from practical lens, how do we characterize, how do we categorize, sorry, genomic data vis-a-vis -vis our doctrines of, of determinism and faith, qada wa qadar, right? So if we find, does it mean, what does it mean? Is this, whose knowledge is this? And what does it mean when we have high probability of 95%, but we have a different theological view of what that occurs or not, right? And if it's just a simple category of knowledge, what is this genetic knowledge? Is it categorically beneficial? Right, then it would be always listed to use. Is it certain? Is it yaqini or or al dhan? We can ground moral obligations within it. Is it just probable? Right. Then we must weigh the harms and risks. This level of analysis of the genetic data is not present within the fiqh. 
we don't go to this level of moral calculus by thinking about statistics beyond what claims are being made in this domain. The human as a reproductive organism, right? So, so if we're gonna think about this theologically, well, is reproduction an essential part of the human being? Allah SWT in the Quran, that right, the dominion belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He creates whom he wills, right? He makes uh, you know, he, he he gives to whom he desires females and gives to whom he wills males, or and he makes them both, right? Gives them males and females. But this this part of the verse, he makes or renders some of them aqim, barren, inabil not able to reproduce, to procreate. So would someone who does not have that be less of a human being? Because it's, if it, if if human reproduction, uh, reproduction, sorry, was essential characteristic of a human being, then there's some problem here with our own doctrine, right? Then the question, as I already mentioned, how do we define parenthood? We know the Quran, for example, says in Walanahum that your mothers are those that bore you, right? That bore you. Um, that's declarative. That's the definition of motherhood, at least, right? And we know from a hadith, al-Farash, that the child is the bedspread, the hajal, and for the adulterer is the stone. So we have uh, scriptural sources to help us think about parenthood, right? The first one is a biological notion of born rearing, right? Of, of gestating, sorry. The other one, what did the farash has just to do with the with the conjugal act. And we know in fiqh it's used just for the relationship. If there is a notable relationship between a man and woman, they're married, there's a nikah, right? Then the child is under theirs. It's a social legal function. So about we have to use our tradition to adjudicate that as well. Lastly, and I'm nearing the end, so, so don't you all shouldn't worry. Um, the human as an evolving entity. As I already mentioned, you know, we live in a society, we're all worried about, you know, uh, you know what's uh, happening with climate change, right? Uh, there are all these, particularly with the pandemic, now we're always thinking about these dystopian futures. Um, there are all these movies about us leaving this planet, right? Um, so we know that we can engineer human beings to survive potentially in other environments, not just ones that have poor air quality here, but other planets, right? If we start experimenting, we can produce human, not produce, but we can uh, uh, modify human beings so that they are more resistant to uh, radio uh, X-rays or gamma rays, right? That their lungs have higher oxygen capa carrying capacity, right? That their bones are stronger. So should we do this? If the human being is always evolving, that's never stable, right? The genomic code, the genetics code was never stable. Then the question becomes for us, how do we think about this? And for us from a tradition, is the human being then, as it is today, the pinnacle of creation? The one created in the best of forms, right? Is that the case? Which human are we talking about? The human from a century ago, from a millennium ago, the human that will come in a millennium from now. What is the human being being talked about here in the Quran? Excuse me, Prof. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. And then what constitutes uh, the Ghayr right? Khalqillah, Yes, inshallah. We got 10 minutes left. So now right. to, to get to the closure, right? I think that when we have a conceptualization with tasweer, right, we have to think about these concepts. So, for example, Francis Collins, right, the NIH director who was leading the genome project, he, he genome, human genome project, he wrote a book and a couple after this that, that basically DNA is the language of God. For us, Say silence is the language of God. How do we? So let me end here with a, just a, as I said at the end. I'm going to talk a little bit about Maqasid for a second. So uh, when a scholar thinks about the rural maslaha, implicitly he's thinking about bridging a scriptural reality, a scriptural notion with social reality. What's occurring today, right? And to answer that question, you know, you have to use both sources. Right. You have to have knowledge come together from the scriptural sources and religious sources. Now, what I'm going to argue is that if you're thinking about whether there's the rura here, you know, interests are at risk or a hardship, haja is needs to be evoked, or if there's maslaha here, that what must happen is that you have to have a moral vision for society and the human being first. What is the society want to achieve? 
what type of human do we want? Does Islam say has to be? Uh, what type of human being do we want to flourish? What is the vision of flourishing? Otherwise, we're just using tools without an end goal. And largely, I think sometimes we forget that. So before we get to the rural and haja, what are the human interests that we're trying to preserve? And why are they? And what do they mean? And how do they mean today versus what they did in the Malaga era? So I'm going to end with this last thing that then we have to think of, as I said, the talk was about Islamic Bible's ontology. We have to think ontologically, and I use that term in an expansive way, right? Uh, what is the human future? Some argue there's a post human future. And then what is the society tomorrow going to look like? If you're going to use those terms, even of just Masla and Darura, we have to have a vision, a counter world, a place we want to go, a society they want to bring about. And in the future, that will change. The human being is always changing in a certain way, right? And the society is also changing in a certain way. So we have to have a moral vision before we start just using uh, the anti-obligation enterprise. I will end there, inshallah. Just want to put a plug for this just came out this month. There's a code. You all can have it, inshallah, if you would like to have that. Zakhlaq. I'm happy to field questions, uh, Dr. Anwar, if you like. Okay, um, thank you, Prof, for such uh, informative and insightful sharing. Um, so to the audience, uh, if you wish to ask any question, you can still type your question in the chat box section, and we will uh, attend your question accordingly. And we do have a uh, few questions already, so allow Yes, Prof, allow me to read the first question from our, yeah, from our Dr. Jannah, uh, from IIUM. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything in full measure and balance, and he wants us again disrupting this balance. How far should science do? If science can do, should it go to that, to that extent? There has been many examples in nature whereby human temperings have caused fasad. So yes, Prof, if you can respond to that first question. So I just have to pay for that question. I'm glad that the open is then, right? So, so that is the crux of the challenge. Um, that how do we conceive about the extent and the limits and the constraints upon the human being? If we should we be focusing on uh, or thinking about living forever, right? Rasulullah rejected that himself. So should we engage in an enterprise that's trying to help us live forever? I'm not saying medicine does that, but there are anti-aging science here, we're trying to think about that, right? Telomeres. And so, so my, my general answer to you is that what you're asking is the, the question we should be asking in Islamic bioethics, right? What is the balance? What sort of society, what sort of human being we, does the tradition call upon us to help flourish and create and, and, and further? Not simply whether some action is halal or haram, because you can have Singular actions, singular fatawa, right? Say this is halal, this is halal, this is halal, this is halal. But the, when you get at the end of that stream, it can be totally different from what the tradition initially thought about as what we should be doing, right? In our Hanafi faith, we have we have these sorts of constructs, right? You develop machinations to make things halal because the singular uh, the singular uh, legal contracts are okay, but the sum total are problematic. So fiqh was never meant to 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 address this. Fiqh was meant to remove sin from an individual act, actor in a certain sense. But fiqh with a big F with an understanding necessitated us to think about it. And I think sometimes we just don't do that. We see we see just simple allowances. Thank you, Prof, for, for your response to that first question. Uh, we have another question from Sister Shamimi, also from IIUM. Uh, thank you, Prof, for the great presentation. If I may ask two questions. Number one, in your opinion, in an education system, particularly in medicine dominated by the Western construct, how do we practically engage with and benefit from contemporary bioethic discourse without losing our ground as a Muslim? How do we benefit from it as much as our past scholars benefited from the Greek philosophy in the past? Probably you can answer to that first, uh, question, bro, and before we go to her second question. Sure. Um... I think what we, uh, you know, what my history in my, in my life, in my career, my scholarship, I'm trying to have appropriate critical critiques of, certain, of, of the enterprise, right? So what, what I mean by that is that we need to have a healthy dose of skepticism and a healthy critique, but one that's reasoned, 
right? With a moral vision that we have to think about. Not that we think that everything, throw the baby out with the bathwater, that everything is, uh, you know, is, 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 a, uh, is driven by some nefarious design, but rather when we think about the course, right? Are we, let's take medicine for a second. Is medicine helping people flourish and be healthier and be well? Or is it an enterprise that's dedicated to figuring out who's got disease and who doesn't? Or when you talk about educational platforms, I ask you this at IIUM, do we start off medicine in the first year of medical school, meeting people who have lived to 90 and 80 and asking them, how did you love so, live so healthily? Or do we start off in an anatomy lab and try to dissect a dying cadaver to understand what the malady was within that person? The educational modality sets up your vision of what that society should look like. And I think all too often we have an uncritical appraisal of that, but we don't want an overcritical appraisal either, right? Don't throw the ba ba a baby with the bath out with the bathwater. We know that there are areas where things are flourishing. People live today that wouldn't be alive. I'm the ER physician. I know that there's certain technologies like TPA have allowed us to have people live today that wouldn't be alive before. That's certainly a positive thing, but just taking things uncritically all the time or not imagining them or not having a moral compass by which to adjudicate these matters leaves us with little. And again, and I'm making this con I'm making these comments because I know I speak to IAMU audience. Fiqh by itself does not adjudicate that for us. It does not adjudicate that for us. It doesn't provide the full moral vision. We need the other sciences as well, and we need the other to understand the social scientific way or the social structuring of medicine in society before we start critiquing it willy nilly. Thank you, Rob. Uh... For that response, yeah, we, we have another question from uh, Mr. Shamimi, so if you may respond to this, to, you, to ask your question. Is the act of appending the Islamic qualifier without firstly deconstructing and reconstructing the philosophical assumptions underpinning variety discourse lead to the conflation and spiritualization of the notion of maslaha and maqasib, or, or is it the other way around? Yeah, I was just thinking about that question. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm not sure sure exactly what the question is. I, I think that I agree with the first part of the notion that we sometimes uncritically append the Islamic qualifier, right, without deconstructing and reconstructing those uh, philosophical uh, assumptions, but not just within the assumptions within the myoethics discourse. As I said, we are sometimes reactive, but within our own tradition. When we talk about hevza nafs, what does that nafs mean? Or hevza, you know, hevza deen, what sort of deen are we talking about? And when we say, well, hevza deen just means freedom of religion. Well, that's a huge gap, right? Uh, that's not the way that Shaltabi or Jawaini were thinking about it, right? Because society was totally different. So I think we need to be deconstructing what their West is presenting, but also deeply reconstructing our own tradition to understand what's happening, right? It's not just a easy enterprise of connecting one thing to another. So I think that's what leads to this sort of the, the masla darura maqasid sort of discourse, which is sometimes superficial. Not that they're not content rich, we just have not gone and gotten the content out to bring that richness forward. So I'll address it in that way, I hope that suffices. Okay, thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, uh, we have another question, uh, but we, we're not sure who's the, but I think, I think it's fine. I think, I think you would love to, to, to respond to the questions. Uh, so, Prof. Asi, there are two questions for, according to the Islamic uh, bioethical perspective. Number one, what are the means of determining death, on um, brain death or heart death? The second one, what is your opinion about cosmetic surgeries, which not as a result of illness, but mainly for just for beautifications? Yeah, Rob. So, so we want to have another four-hour conversation about brain death. Um, I've written a lot about brain death, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to. First of all, I'm not a mufti, so I'm not going to give an opinion. But, but I'll say that there are three different views, right? That brain death is death. Brain death is a state between dying and as a dying state between living and dead. And brain death is not death. So that's the general sort of scope of our jurists thinking about these things. What I will say. However, and for this audience again, so some of the, what I'm saying today is for an audience that I know is in an in amazing university at IAUM and thinks critically and deeply about things. The field of, of, of end of life care 
is replete with ver, uh, with vernacular that are fact value fusions. And for Muslims, we must think about the medical fact, but what the value was fused upon it. Brain death is an example, right? The brain doesn't die. There's no, what do you say? A cell died, my hair died. I, we don't talk about that, right? But the idea of a fact value fusion, there is a certain fact that there's a prognostic reality of individuals declared brain death, brain dead, that they will not return to consciousness. That fact was fused with a value that this means death of the person. And then you have the, the, the conjunction, brain death. Similarly, suffering, right? Suffering is used in the life care. Well, suffering means what? There's a fact, perhaps people are in pain. Then we apply a value that this is something that's, that should be removed and it's obligated for a healthcare to remove pain. And then you join them together and you have this notion of suffering at the end of life, that we should then use medications to reduce pain, perhaps even sedate people when they're dying because it's a fact value fusion. So medicine is, is replete with this. So like the previous uh, scholar was asking me, we must separate the fact, then apply our own values from the tradition, right? That's what we need to do. That's the enterprise. You need pretty, you know, pretty savvy individuals and thinkers to do that, who understand both the science, the implications of the science, but also the values from our tradition and then merge them together. And I want to address cosmetic surgeries again. You can find your local mufti, uh, you know, local sheikh to answer that question. Thank you, Prof. Uh, next question from uh, Dr. Yusuf. Um, you said human interest should be taken into consideration before engaging in the rura or maslaha. However, it is said human interest tend to corrupt. Can you elaborate further on the scope of human interest? Sorry, I, I, what I meant uh, by that comment was that maqasid, what are maqasid? Maqasid are human interests that the legislator legislates around, right? Maslah an nas, that, that, right? The masali an nas, that, 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 that hibs al ma, the mal, uh, aqal, uh, nasal, uh, that all these are human interests that the edifice of Islamic law, the lawgiver Allah SWT and Rasulullah SAW, legislate around to protect. So my point was that those are the human interests. They are beneficial and it's our interest as human beings that these things be present. So my retort to that is then let's define what the human being and those interests are today. What do we mean? What did the tradition mean by that interest of, of, of wealth, of progeny? that when we use a maqasa discourse, we can't simply just say, map it on into surface level, what does medicine say today? But rather, what's the deep content between this notion of nafs or deen within our tradition, within the theologians who are thinking about the maqasid, and then bring that to today, say, how does it match up? What we thought about wealth at that time is not wealth today. The human beings' interests have shifted in a certain way, so you must, but we must first discover what they were talking about to then think how they matches up with today, as opposed to just uncritically saying that hibs and nafs means save life. That's not necessarily the case because you're allowed to give up your life to defend your faith by film. You're allowed to give up your life if you know for your property to save your property. You're allowed to give your life up for religion and jihad. So it's not just protecting life. So that's what I meant by human interests that the rura and maslaha are all based on a, a, a notion of what those human interests are, we must investigate further from our tradition what that meant, what those human interests are to, for today by recovering what they were in the past, a fuller conceptualization of those. Um, thank you, Prof. Again, uh, we saw uh, someone uh, raising your hand. Uh, again, we may allow uh, only from one participant for to ask uh, verbally, so I think Sister Amana, if you can quickly ask your questions and would allow uh, Prof to respond. 
Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, I did not get it. Can, can I actually ask the question? Or, or you were saying I have to type, type it uh, in the chat window? <clears throat> yeah, you, you may ask. Uh, we, we will allow one from the audience. You may ask quickly, sister, please. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, um, it's less of a question and more of a comment. Jazakallah like, khair, brother Asim, Dr. Asim, for, for this very enlightening um, uh, discussion. I would say that this is something that's really absent uh, in the Muslim discourse, uh, that, you know, looking at the worldview. Uh, but, but I think precisely the reason behind this is uh, what, what you mentioned, the educational imperialism having to do with the whole colonial history. Um, so um, so it's, it's something that Muslims just, you know, they had to struggle with, right? So we were faced with the situation in which we were faced. It's not just medicine, it's happening in all the fields. Um, and it's it's more or less the same that we, we were sort of thrown in a situation in the post-colonial context. And then we had to struggle. And, and that's sort of, that that's not a justification, of course, for, for the, the way uh, Muslims, including the scholars are dealing with these things, right? Not going deep enough what, what you just mentioned, not looking at the ontologies, not looking at the worldviews and just, you know, have, you know, because sort of we are, we are in a situation, right? We are, we, are, we are sort of in the middle of the ocean and then you, you we are bombarded. We are sort of offered all these um, uh, advancements in all these fields, whether it's AI, whether it's, you know, health technologies. And then, you know, um, we just have to, you know, find some, some very workable, quick answers to things, you know, whether we should be using this, you know, that sort of halal haram fatwa, um, and then, you know, go on and, and we, we, we get to have something else that, that comes our way, right? Uh, so sort of what, 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 how I characterize this is that, you know, sort of we have to rebuild the ship while being in the middle of the ocean. Uh, because um, I've been working on things like, you know, the Islamic response towards AI and so on. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's almost the same in every field, right? So we, we were not the pioneers of the modern medicine, right? And it's, it's definitely um, a, a category mistake to, uh, to sort of equate uh, what Muslims used to do in the name of medicine, let's say 500 years ago with, with what's going on in modern medicine today. You know, as you mentioned yourself, the very different um, ontology that is informing the contemporary uh, um, paradigm of medicine, you know, even things such, such basic, concepts as you know disease health life you know they, they they have to be answered in the context of the the overall islamic teleological you know uh, ideas such as you know the meaning the worth of life as how we see it you know um how we define things like disease health wellness etc right um now my question is um and it's even even the, the examples where we mentioned that you know such and such for instance medical technologies or medical methodology. You can make your question uh, short and concise so that uh, Prof can respond. Uh, right, right, right. Um, so, so quickly, just the, um, now, given that this is the situation and, and people like you are, are trying to, um, to, to, to make the Muslims realize that the discourse is not going in the right direction, of course, uh, there needs to be an understanding, appreciation of the fact that that we need to dig deeper, right? But then, you know, the, the kind of situation in which we find ourselves, in which we are sort of forced to to become to 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 adopt uh, modern health practices, and that has actually reshaped our worldview, reshaped our theology, right? Um, no. Okay, so I'm gonna. I, I will ask a prof to respond. Uh, I will ask prof to respond. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comment. So, so Jazak al for for your analysis. I, I don't disagree with your analysis that we are as a com global community um, confronted with a lot of challenges that have roots in colonial history um, and roots in the educational enterprises that 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 have been set up. But there's also positivity in things. Are you know we have individuals as yourself the IIUM and other places, even in, uh, here in, in, in the United States, we're trying to recover, we, we understand our tradition, but also uh, critically appraise the world and the world around us. So I, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, totally pessimistic. I am optimistic about the future. And that's actually part of my talk that we should just reorient ourselves a little bit. Now, now I think your, your question sort of uh, doesn't really have an answer. Uh, it, it's sort of, it's the reality that we face. Uh, 
we will see inshallah what people such as yourself and others and and the colleagues at this at this institution and uh, those of you on the conference and the congress well, what do we make of it right what are we going to fashion for ourselves in the future and then we can say okay whether this was you know this was a worthy enterprise or not i don't i don't think that we have a, an answer i just want us to be aware of where we need to potentially go so that's my my, my closing comment in that sense to you Thank you, Prof, for, for your response uh, to our sister Amman. I just now I, I would like to apologize for having to cut and pass the program as we are running out of time. Um, to other questions, uh, I, I would like to apologize because uh, we are at the end of our, already at the end of our session today. Uh, but I will try to uh, to pass the question to Prof Asim later and hopefully he may uh, answer to us uh, um, at its convenience later, inshallah. Uh, thank you uh, again, Professor uh, Dr. Asim, for your insightful uh, sharing. And I believe uh, the participants have uh, benefited a lot from this session. And uh, if, you might, if you don't mind, Prof, uh, to unshare your screen because uh, the committee will, uh, will have uh, the photography session. And to other participants, we would like you to switch on your webcam. So you will be on the screen, inshallah. And uh, uh, with that, uh, I will uh, pass back to uh, our main uh, MC, Esther Safura. And thank you again, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Chi.